Good morning, class. Today, uh, we're going to focus upon module seven. Uh, and so I'm going to share my screen and we'll get right into it. And so today, um, module seven is, of course, uh, urban climate vulnerability global to local scales. Uh, and so and so here is the assignment, uh, urban climate vulnerability, global to local scales. Uh, so you will begin by reading the research materials and articles that are associated with the assignment. So you will go to content and here are the research materials. Uh, this recording will be added to the research materials. Uh, the uh, presentation I'm about to make is here. And so here is a, is a variety of materials, uh, specifically looking at uh, urban environments globally. And specifically, we're looking at the threat posed to human health uh, and development and, and you might say happiness that is posed by the combined impact of human population growth uh, in urban areas uh, combined with climate change. You know, the collision between these two phenomena is going to put a lot of populations at risk. In fact, I'm sure you've heard that COVID-19 is directly related to increased urbanization, and global warming. Uh, the pandemics that are going to come next are also related to these two phenomena. So let's get right into it. I'm going to open up the presentation and get it into uh, presentation mode here in a moment. And then we'll get started with the presentation. Uh, well, so I just want you to think about what is happening globally uh, in terms of climate change and urbanization. And so again, this is urban climate vulnerability global to local scales. So we're going to start off looking at this from a global perspective uh, and then we're going to move on to other aspects of this issue. Um, so first let's look at the uh, contents of the presentation. Again, we're going to look at this from a global standpoint uh, and then I'm going to show you some of the work that I'm doing here in the United States in several uh, Gulf Coast cities, uh, looking at communities on the Gulf Coast as they are actively working to mitigate the impacts of urban climate vulnerability. Uh, this is via my work with this HBCU community-based organization, Gulf Coast Equity Project. And then, of course, this, these issues uh, provide a lot of opportunities for you uh, as you uh, start to decide what it is you're going to do uh, after you leave Tennessee State University. And there are a variety of opportunities out there that are emerging 
uh, no matter what your major happens to be. Uh, this issue is going to create opportunity. Like I said, we can look at this one of two ways. We can say, well, this is a disaster, uh, we're doomed, uh, or we can say, okay, this is a challenge. Uh, what kinds of opportunities are out there for me or us to mitigate these impacts? And so I'll talk about those. Okay, so what's happening? Um, cities are growing. Urban populations are growing. Um, but unfortunately, the sections of cities that are growing in developing nations are what we would call slums um, or unplanned settlements, or we might also call them by other names. But what they do have in common is a lack of clean water, something that we take for granted here. Um, we can pretty much get water in most cases whenever we want. Uh, out not being able to get water in this country is so unusual that it makes national news, such as the situation in Flint, Michigan. Now, Flint, Michigan is everyday life in other parts of the world, as you will soon see. Uh, lack of clean water is not just an inconvenience, it's a matter of life and death. Um, well over a million people die each year just because they don't have clean water and sanitation. You know, things that we expect to have here. Now this map is from 2012. It's kind of dated. I probably need to up, I mean map, excuse me, this chart, this table. It's a little bit dated. I probably need to um, update it. But you can see that cities are growing and that they were all very large. Population density, uh, as you can see, is extremely high in some cities, up to uh, 24,000 people per square kilometer in some cases. Or in Bangladesh, 115,000 people per square kilometer. Uh, just compare that with uh, New York City which if you've ever been there, uh, might appear to be quite crowded. So New York City has only approximately 4,600 people per square kilometer. And so think about that. When you look at Bangladesh, uh, Dhaka, excuse me, Dhaka, Bangladesh, which has 115,000 people per square kilometer. Um, that's almost unimaginable. That's even more crowded, say, than some of the major cities in China that tend to be extremely crowded. Um, and so these cities are large and they're growing. Uh, and so what has happened is in the past, within the past two years, we have come to a point in history globally that we now have more people living in cities than living in rural areas. Um, and that is going to pose some challenges because again, in other parts of the world, as people move to cities in this rural to urban migration pattern, uh, when people get to those cities, they usually wind up in unplanned settlements, no water, no sanitation. So rural to urban migration is what is happening, which is, is dominant right now. Um, I think I read somewhere that by 2050, two thirds of the world's population is going to be in urban areas. So why are people moving to cities? Well, there are pull factors and push factors when we talk about migration. Um, a pull factor is something that draws you to a place. So why are people drawn to cities? Well, uh, again, unlike in our country and other parts of the world, healthcare is not ubiquitous or good healthcare, any healthcare. In some cases, if a person is in India or Africa, 
uh, he or she may have to travel several hundred miles just to get to the nearest clinic, not a hospital, just a clinic that may or may not have uh, ample supply of medicines. And so a lot of people, if they are facing illness or if their children are, are sick, will walk hundreds of miles to the city uh, in hopes of getting medical attention. Um, another pull factor, obviously, is economic opportunity. Uh, in many cases, people are in countries where they don't have resources, they don't have money, uh, they don't have a means of supporting themselves. And so the option is, okay, well, let's move to the nearest city, nearest large city. And in some cases, they get there and there's nothing there for them. And you might ask, well, how, how come these people don't know? Why, why, why don't they know better? than to go to a city that has nothing to offer them. Well, unlike here where we have all kinds of lines of communication, television, radio, to, uh, mobile devices, internet, on and on and on. There's information everywhere here. That's not the case in most parts, in many parts of the world. Many part, in many parts of the developing world, people aren't watching CNN daily and hearing about the growing slums in the nearest large city. Uh, they don't know until they get there. And then it might be too late to turn back, or turning back might mean certain death. Uh, so economic opportunity, access to health care are just two things that pull people towards cities. So what about push factors? What are things that make people leave rural areas? Well, climate change, global warming is resulting in Droughts becoming more extreme. A drought is a naturally occurring process uh, whereby there's less precipitation than normal. Uh, it's a naturally occurring process. We humans can't do anything about it. Um, but connected to drought is something here called desertification. So desertification is when human beings mismanage land and cause soil ruination. Uh, the best case of that here was the Dust Bowl. Some of you referred to the Dust Bowl uh, in your uh, oral presentations. And so the Dust Bowl was when we here in the United States uh, in the early part of the 20th century really didn't have a lot of rules with regard to land use management in the West. Uh, that's another reason it was called the Wild Wild West. People put as many cattle on their property as they wanted. Uh, people planted crops as often as they wanted. Uh, people did what they wanted to their land. And it wasn't used sustainably. And when drought came along, uh, the soil was completely ruined. And it blew all the way to Washington, D.C. It was so bad during the Dust Bowl that it, at noon in Washington, D.C., it looked like it was the middle of the night. That's how significant of a disaster the Dust Bowl was. Uh, we learned our lesson from that desertification experience that we had here. Um, but of course, other parts of the world don't have the resources that we have and the ability to adjust. And so they're still struggling uh, with desertification. Uh, in our part of the world, we have a relatively consistent climate regime. Uh, when we get closer to the equator in the inter intertropical convergent zone, uh, we see uh, climate regions that have wet seasons and dry seasons. And those regions, such as the Sahel region of Africa and similar places, are often visited by drought. And so if human beings uh, are not really careful managing the land there, Desertification can easily happen, uh, even in and around urban areas. Uh, one of the contributors to desertification is deforestation. Uh, cutting down trees faster than trees can replenish themselves. Uh, so why are people cutting down trees? Well, a lot of the things that we use electricity for in this country, people use wood for in other parts of the world, cooking, doing laundry, 
and so on and so forth. So in many parts of the world, wood is the primary domestic energy source, not natural gas, not electricity. Uh, and so when these populations are growing in these unplanned settlements around cities, people are still going to go out into the um, exterior areas and get tr and cut down trees for, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes the trees are cut down for uh, economic reasons. And so when people are in rural areas and they're facing drought and desertification, uh, they often are pushed away into cities uh, because they cannot feed themselves. A lot of places in the world, in rural areas, people are still engaged in what we call subsistence agriculture. Uh, where they basically live off the land. If the land is able to, unable to sustain them, they have to move or starve to death. And oftentimes they move to cities. Uh, so these are just two, some of the factors that are moving people from rural areas to urban areas. Um, and as global warming and climate change continue uh, and it becomes more and more difficult to sustain oneself in a rural area with subsistence farming practices, uh, we're going to see cities grow. Uh, the term that's associated with human population growing faster than cities can support them is over-urbanization. Over-urbanization is too many people, not enough water supply. Too many people, not enough sanitation. Too many people, not enough housing. Too many people, not enough food. Uh, you pretty much get the picture. That's what over-urbanization is, and that's essentially the problem that we are dealing with in many parts of the developing world, uh, which obviously have negative impacts upon human health when there's lack of clean water, uh, lack of sanitation. Also, there are there's lack of housing, there are land use issues, infrastructure problems, insufficient waste management, no trash collection is happening in many cases unless communities themselves engage in collecting their own trash and, and refuse. Uh, those items are going to pile up. Uh, that would even happen here. You know, if we did not have constant trash collection, you would not believe how much garbage we produce here. But we have a system to get rid of it. What if we lived in a place where there was no system to get rid of trash? then we would see trash right next to us, along with what comes with trash. Vermin, rats, mosquitoes, so on and so forth. Uh, so here are just some examples of unplanned settlements. Here is a shanty town in South Africa. Notice that one of the things you notice is this water that's in the middle of this, I guess, path can't call it a road. Um, notice the, the trash, the garbage. Um, there's probably obviously no sanitation system here. So that water is probably contaminated with human waste. Okay. Um, the small, I guess we would call them shacks that we see people living in in this picture. Uh, there might be anywhere from eight or nine people living in each one of these shacks. So we're not talking about one person per shack or even one family of four in a shack. We might, there might be three generations of people, uh, eight or nine of them in one shack, right? And so you can imagine with something like COVID-19 and how contagious it is uh, in the, hitting a situation like this. And that's what's happening right now on the African continent. They, they are extremely vulnerable, much higher population densities in these um, communities, and really no way to do contact tracing. How are we going to do contact tracing in a place where people don't have um, mobile devices or even with, you know, non-technical contact tracing? Uh, you're basically going to come in contact with everybody in your community here. Uh, at one point in time or another. Um, in Latin America, unplanned settlements are called favelas. 
And so one of the issues you see here is that the, in Latin America, uh, the region is very mountainous, uh, very steep topography and terrain. A lot of the less favorable land is up in the hills, which is the exact opposite of our experience here. As you have looked, when you look at some of the materials, when you look at the uh, video on um, about the um, uh, Wedgwood community and specifically the Turkey Creek community in Mississippi, uh, you know that African Americans in this country oftentimes were forced to settle in swamplands, in wetlands, in what was very undesirable, uh, low land. You know, um, but and then the wealthier people lived up in the hills, right? In our country, but in Latin America, it's the opposite. You have these very unstable structures you know, up going up into the sides of hills. So as global warming produces more intense rainfalls and hurricanes, you can only imagine what's going to happen to a slope like this if it becomes liquefied by rain. There's gonna be a landslide or a mudslide. Many people are gonna be killed. And unfortunately, that happens very often in throughout Latin America. If you pay any attention to the news, uh, you will notice that on a regular basis, uh, people are killed by mudslides in Latin America. In fact, in 1998, Hurricane Mitch struck Central America and killed about 20,000 people, many of whom were never found because they were buried under tons and tons and tons of mud uh, from living in these uh, favelas. Let's look at Mexico City, which was one, one of, still one of the largest cities in the world. Uh, Mexico City has struggled with water issues and continues to do so. Uh, notice the caption of this picture. After waiting for more than five hours at a water distribution center to get delivery of her weekly ration of water, Raquel Villanueva, 31, prepares to wash her dishes at her home in Mexico City. Many of the city's 20 million people get by on as little as one hour of running water per week. And this is in the city. Uh, so you can see how serious this issue is uh, shortage of water in urban areas in many parts of the world where people have to wait five hours just to get a ration of water and all we have to do is go turn a tap and we're so spoiled that if the water doesn't come out of the tap fast enough if we don't have water pressure or if it isn't hot enough fast enough you know we get an attitude we complain uh, but in other parts of the world people are just glad to have any kind of clean water from anywhere and will wait for five hours in line for it. Um, and again, this is a problem that is in Latin America. Uh, here's Sao Paulo, which is another one of the largest cities in the world. Um, and so we can see uh, here uh, Brazil, uh, India. Uh, and so we can see that you know, this is the situation that will become exacerbated as these cities get larger and larger and larger, especially in places where people don't have easy access to water. Uh, and so the United Nations uh, and the world is recognizing that this, you know, managing urban areas during a time of climate change is one of the most difficult challenges that we're going to face in the 21st century. Uh, but like I said, we can either look at this as a disaster or, or we can just fold up our tents and, and, and call it quits. Or we can say these are challenges that have agricultural solutions. These are challenges that have solutions in social science and political science. These are challenges that perhaps have solutions um, in engineering. Uh, there are various solutions that you all can possibly develop and contribute to uh, as you matriculate out of Tennessee State University. Uh, it's said that half of the 
careers, um, having the careers that are going to be available to you um, and when you graduate, you know, if you happen to be a freshman, most of you aren't. But if, when you were a freshman, half of those careers didn't even exist uh, until you graduated. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, so when we look at vulnerability, there are a variety of health factors that are associated with uh, climate change specifically in urban communities. Uh, we'll talk later on this week about urban heat islands uh, and of course increased uh, temperatures affect people who have cardiovascular disease including asthma and so of course we know that COVID-19 is a respiratory illness and so um, pollution levels are higher and so this Phenomena, these two phenomena crossing each other uh, is going to present a big health problem uh, to be dealt with throughout the globe. And again, anthropogenic human caused uh, climate change is resulting in much greater extremes uh, in terms of the, uh, if we look at the monsoon season in the Indian Peninsula. We're getting much larger floods, uh, floods that happen every year in that part of the world. India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, see these monsoon floods every single year. Uh, biblical size flooding uh, that we would call a catastrophe here if it happened one time, happens every year in that part of the world, uh, striking cities there and urban populations. And it's only going to become more um, difficult to deal with. And again, here we have a graph showing, even in this country, trends in increased uh, precipitation on the upswing. Uh, and we saw this, of course, almost 15 years ago in New Orleans uh, with Hurricane Katrina flooding 80% of the city. Uh, and so that year, 2000, well, 2004 and 2005 really started an uptick in these large hurricanes that we continue to see to this day uh, uh, going from a category one hurricane to a category five in the course of a day which in the past would take five days or a week now we're seeing these super storms explode to category four and five in one day uh, creating these uh, nightmare storms So now let's switch gears a little bit and look at uh, the local scale urban climate vulnerability. And so for the past um, three years, I've been working with the uh, HBCU community-based organization, Gulf Coast Equity Project, citizen science-based approaches to mitigating the impacts of urban climate vulnerability. Uh, and so this is a project that's funded largely by the Kellogg Foundation and managed by uh, Dr. Beverly Wright of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice and Dr. Robert Bullard, who many people consider the father of environmental justice. Dr. Wright and Dr. Bullard are both have, have PhDs in sociology. So we're working with community-based organizations throughout the Gulf Coast region uh, the Wedgwood community near Pensacola, Florida, Africa Town community in Mobile, Alabama, the Lower Ninth Ward community in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, the Turkey Creek community in Gulfport, Mississippi, and the Pleasantville community in Houston, Texas, and of course other communities throughout the country. Um, and we're collaborating with several other HBCUs you can see listed there. Uh, and one of the main goals is using community based mapping as a way to uh, mitigate the impacts of flooding and water contamination. I'm just gonna show you a few examples of exactly what we're doing. So in Houston, Texas, um, Hurricane Harvey uh, was um, one of the most incredible storm events anybody's ever seen in 
the history of this country or anywhere. Uh, the hurricane, uh, even after it weakened, uh, dumped up to 50 and 60 inches of precipitation in areas in and around Houston, Texas, which is almost unfathomable. Uh, and so even though Hurricane Harvey was an extreme, um, Houston has always had flood problems. This is nothing new. And particularly the uh, lower income and maybe not so upwardly mobile communities in Houston are especially impacted by flooding. And there are all kinds of impacts. There's obvious immediate danger to human life of flash flooding. Then, of course, there's the risk of losing one's home and not having homeowners insurance and, and completely losing everything you own along with them. There's always that risk. Uh, and so we're working with the Pleasant Town community specifically uh, to engage them actively in flood hazard mitigation, which, as you all know, is going to become more likely to occur. Uh, we might see another Hurricane Harvey in Houston. Uh, hopefully not, but even without Hurricane Harvey, there are storms and floods that have to be managed in ways that people won't suffer losses over and over and over again into the future, where perhaps some of these communities may become uninhabited. Uh, we're working in the Wedgwood community in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, and here we're looking at not just flood risk, but also groundwater contamination hazards. Uh, and so here is a um, uh, infographic that I created showing groundwater flow. Uh, so what's happening in the Wedgwood community is this community is, if you watch the, um, the, um, documentary voiceless uh, you will see that this community has 13 landfills and borrow pits right around their community but these landfills and borrow pits are directly connected to um, the waterways in and around this area that literally connect everyone as you can see on this map so this is a map that that uh, help the community to finally convince their county commission to at least put together an ad hoc committee to an ad hoc committee to look into the risks associated with contamination flowing not only above ground but also underground. Uh, the next case study is the uh, Turkey Creek community. So uh, this is. This community is a subject of the Come Hell or High Water documentary that you should take a look at. Uh, in this community, we're looking at the risk of, of flooding from a property that is being developed adjacent to the community. So the property is represented by this red box. And so we have the Turkey Creek community, which is here to the north. And the question is, we know that this property is contaminated arsenic and lead, uh, but the question is, if this if property, if this land is disturbed, will that runoff and through flow affect the community of Turkey Creek, which is a historically black community that we're working with. Uh, and so here is the surface flow direction. Uh, and so you notice that surface flow is toward the north and the Turkey Creek community is north of this property. Uh, we also see that the groundwater flow, uh, which is a relatively shallow groundwater flow, uh, flows north towards Turkey Creek. The groundwater is contaminated again with lead and arsenic. And so those contaminants could very easily come back to the surface uh, where children are playing in um, ponds and rainwater. You know, that's what kids do. They play in little streams and uh, they could become exposed to these various 
contaminants. Uh, and again, this is all looking at connection between water, climate change, and urban communities. I'm sure you've heard about the Lower Ninth Ward community in New Orleans, Louisiana. We're also working with this community in um, New Orleans. The entire city is several feet below sea level, making it extremely prone to flooding at any time. Uh, not just during Hurricane Katrina, but any time. Uh, and so what we did was we engaged this community in a community asset mapping exercise where they um, map their wetland areas and other areas that uh, could be used as um, uh, perhaps rain gardens and other uh, what we call green infrastructures uh, uh, that could be used to mitigate flooding. Uh, so a green infrastructure is when we use uh, natural systems to replace uh, human-made systems. Uh, and so one type of urban infrastructure is a rain garden. Uh, and so rivers and streams, excuse me, plants are able to absorb massive amounts of water. Uh, and so instead of paving a place over and digging up the ground and putting in a sewer pipe, in some cases, if we create a rain garden made up of trees and grass, and even we can make it into an urban garden where people can grow food, water can be directed into that area uh, that is left alone and not developed and not contribute to flooding the rest of the residential property around it. So that's one way that um, this community was looking at green infrastructure in fact, as a way of mitigating flooding. As you can see here, this is the same data collection sheet that you all used last week. And so here is another example of asset mapping. In this case, uh, they're mapping locations of catchment basins. And so these catchment basins are places where you essentially have storm drain. Uh, in many cases, the storm drain is not clean. Notice all of these not clean storm drains that were reported by our community um, activists. And if the drains are clogged, they are not going to allow water to drain out of the uh, community. And of course, if that happens, flooding occurs. Uh, and so we have all of these um, efforts to have communities work together, perhaps adopt the drainage basin so that the community members can clean the basins themselves and allow for the city of New Orleans to deal with the drains that are actually damaged as opposed to just being clogged. Um, and so this is, this is another way, as you can see, this is the exact same sheet you used uh, they can cooperatively engage in mitigating flooding, which again is going to be a problem in the future in New Orleans, no matter what happens. And so here is uh, just a result of some of the mapping work that the uh, volunteers did in New Orleans. Um, so the question is, well, what can you do? So like I said, the uh, global change and increased urbanization will provide many opportunities, whether it be in STEM fields, earth science fields, agriculture, social science, or what have you. Um, obviously, geographic information systems and geospatial technology is going to be actively used uh, in examining, assessing these issues, whether it's remote sensing or community-based mapping or what have you. So there'll be so your exposure to this technology in this course. I don't know whether it's your first exposure, um, but you should utilize the map products that you produce here um, as part of your digital uh, resume, so to speak, or your digital portfolio. Show people that you can use this technology, and that will open up doors for you. As jobs and careers requiring that kind of uh, 
background in geospatial technology will become more and more prevalent. Uh, again, engineering, green infrastructure, uh, developing solar powered means of cleaning water, solar powered sanitation facilities. I mean, this is cutting edge uh, technology, technology that's being used to provide clean water to people in places where energy is not available. Um, just like water in many parts of the world, electricity is not available. People don't have electricity or they might have electricity infrequently. Um, so clean water requires energy. Uh, so now there are innovations being uh, undertaken in Nigeria, in other parts of the world, uh, where solar power is being used to produce clean water supply, uh, which is a game changer, uh, really. Uh, green infrastructure, when we look at different ways to build buildings to keep our cities cooler, uh, different ways to build buildings so that we don't have sick buildings and, and people breathing uh, contaminated air. Uh, when we use plants to cool buildings, uh, we use plants to direct water away from buildings. Green infrastructure is a very um, significant area of growth in architecture and architectural engineering. Um, obviously, geosciences, hydrology, climatology, or other ways that um, people from a variety of backgrounds can get involved in looking at climate change is not only a natural phenomenon, but also a phenomenon that, as you can see, has economic consequences. Uh, and so, you know, assessing the impact of future climate change is also part of an economist's uh, job or career. So uh, business interest, uh, I actually met a, a climatologist who worked for an investment bank um, because these banks uh, project uh, what's going to occur in the future to determine what they're going to invest in. And a lot of what people invest in uh, is affected by the climate. And people have to be prepared for climate change and what's going to happen five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now to determine you know, what parts of um, markets are going to grow and which parts are going to shrink. Uh, and so clearly here, you can see that perhaps the insurance, the home insurance market is obviously going to be affected. Uh, the housing market is obviously going to be affected uh, by climate change. Uh, so there are some opportunities for you to get involved on the ground in networking. So there's the National Association of Black Geoscientists, which is, you know, if you're in engineering and you're working in earth science, if you're in agriculture and you're working in earth science, if you're in health, public health, and you are looking at issues with regard to climate change and health, uh, you could perhaps uh, become involved or associated with the National Association of Black Geoscientists. Uh, and there are lots of student opportunities with this organization and others. Um, there is the HBCU Climate Change Conference, which is produced by the uh, HBCU Climate Change Consortium, of which Tennessee State University not only is a member, but is a founding member. Uh, we started off with maybe six HBCUs about seven years ago, um, and now we're up to close to 50. Uh, we are hoping to have the eighth conference this year. It will be in New Orleans at the end of October. Uh, I typically take several students with me, and the uh, call for papers is still out. It's not call for abstracts for students is, is uh, June 1st. Um, if you are doing some form of research that you think has anything to do with the environmental studies or climate change, um, let me know. Uh, I've actually 
had agricultural science students go with me and do presentations at this conference. Uh, one of them actually wound up working uh, for the uh, for NOAA. Uh, as a result of contacts she made at this conference. Another one of them is finishing his PhD in climate science at the University of Arizona as a result of you know, his seeing the connection between agricultural science and climate change. Um, uh, the American Meteorological Society meets every year and has a very large and significant student conference great place to get um, con in contact with people who have uh, connections to graduate programs and graduate fellowships, assistantships, or careers, and so on and so forth. So the AMS starts off a portion of its conference specifically dedicated to students. While we're looking at the American Meteorological Society, which is the largest society of climate and meteorological scientists in the world. You can see here, this is from 2016, but this whole area of understanding urban growth and climate variability is a growing area of interest uh, and focus for research and um, study. Uh, SOARS. SOARS is Significant Opportunities in Atmospheric Research and Science. Uh, it's an undergraduate uh, summer program uh, that is, I don't know if it's going to happen this summer, but um, perhaps next summer, but it's specifically for students that are underrepresented in climate science uh, or, or sciences that are related to climate studies. You don't necessarily have to be uh, a meteorolo meteorology major or climatology major. Uh, I've known students from all kinds of majors who have been SOARS fellows. So you might want to check that out. I don't, I don't know if they're going to have a SOARS this summer. Uh, Stanford's SURGE um, re Summer Research Program. It's a very competitive program, but again, targets students that are underrepresented in STEM fields. You go out to Stanford University. This is a very, very um, high profile uh, program to consider. Uh, the, for internships, there's the Student Conservation Association that is obviously looking at issues associated with climate change and you can be any major. Uh, the SDA specifically has a GIS core or GIS track uh, for internships. Uh, and then, of course, here are some of the information sources that are also listed along with the reading assignments, the United Nations Center for Human Settlements, um, Population Reference Bureau is another data source, um, the World Bank, uh, all of these organizations, the uh, United Nations Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, Urban Areas is a focus of the uh, IPCC report, and you have a copy of that in your reading materials. Uh, you also have a copy of this relatively new book, uh, Climate Change, Infrastructure, Urban S Systems and Vulnerabilities, and that's just another resource that you have as you prepare your essay. Um, Here's another uh, publication, Resilience Matters, uh, that is available to you, specifically the Urban Resilience Project. So resiliency is something that we look at in terms of how a community recovers from a disaster or how a community manages or is able to mitigate. Uh, and so resiliency is going to differ from place to place. Uh, obviously, parts of the world, such as the United States, that have more money and more resources, we are going to be more resilient than other places in the world when some of these disasters occur. Uh, and then we get, when we get inside of the United States, obviously the communities that we're working with with the Gulf Coast Equity Project are probably going to be less resilient than, than areas that have more money and more resources. And so we're all trying to 
make for a more uh, equitable uh, world and place, at least as equitable as possible. Uh, also in your reading materials is a copy of Urban Climate Mitigation Techniques. You know, just to give you a taste of what is happening, like I said, this is cutting edge um, research here. Just giving you some resources. Uh, then we get into some, again, more solutions. Solar power in Nigeria being used to uh, mitigate the impacts of urban, urban climate vulnerability. And you will see that in this um, documentary, it's shown how solar power is literally saving lives uh, by providing energy to hospitals. Remember, a lot of the medicines that people need have to be refrigerated. You can't refrigerate these medicines without electricity. And so a lot of people uh, would be unable to access medicines they need in areas that could not refrigerate those medicines. But now there are innovations here in Nigeria showing how solar power can be used to keep those medicines refrigerated and literally save people's lives with solar power. Um, and, all, and finally, probably the greatest example of, of um, community-based activism uh, is Wingard, Dr. Wingard Mathai, who unfortunately passed away in uh, 2011. Um, I had the very fortunate uh, opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Mathai in person in San Diego years ago. It was probably um, one of the greatest moments of my professional life. Um, but Wingard Mathai was the first um, African woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize because, as you can see in this video, uh, she essentially used um, environmental sustainability, largely a woman-led environmental sustainability movement to bring peace to Kenya. So this is a fascinating story uh, that you should um, watch in this video as a way of bringing hope, as a way of saying that there are ways that even one person can create solutions to what might appear to be insurmountable problems. Uh, so it, you, you could be one of those people, uh, as long as you study, work hard, and continue to move forward. Um, so I want to end this slideshow, and let's get back into the um, assignment again. So you have a number of reading materials here, including videos uh, and so on and so forth. There's lots of them. Uh, and so the, the goal here is for you to um, get as much of a of an idea of what we're looking at here is possible in terms of urban uh, urban climate vulnerability. Uh, and so as you get into the uh, assignment once again, uh, let's look at what is required. Um, so module seven, urban climate vulnerability. I'll have to go into it a different way than you all go into it because I'm going into it as a uh, instructor. And so again, you will read the articles and materials, refer to this recorded presentation. Uh, please watch the Flight of Flamingos video. That Flight of Flamingos video is a documentary about um, mitigation strategies for over urbanization in Nakuru Town, Kenya. And it really puts in a nutshell 
uh, how communities are responding to this issue. Uh, and what I really like about that video is it shows you know, African people themselves uh, finding ways to mitigate these issues. Um, also watch the voiceless and come hell or high water videos, which give us a more local version of approaches to these issues of urban climate vulnerability and communities efforts to fight and mitigate them. Uh, so you will write a 750 word essay. And in that essay, I want you to look at some of the differences in mitigation strategies uh, and issues uh, in developing world cities versus U.S. cities. And there are many and they are pretty obvious when you start to look at the differences in the issues and mitigation strategy. In other words, we, we have a different viewpoint on urban climate vulnerability in this country versus the rest of the world for a lot of obvious reasons. Uh, how might we take what we know and fix some of these issues uh, in places that don't have electricity, in places that perhaps don't have running water, in places where certain resources represent more than just um, food to some people. You know, and we're, we're looking at some challenges that you're going to have to, you're going to have to step outside of your comfort zone to address. Uh, obviously, cite all of your sources. Um, you should reference at least five of the assigned research materials. So again, I, I'm not expecting you to read all of these materials. Just zero in on something very specific that you want to look at uh, in terms of urban climate vulnerability from global to local scales and approach it from that standpoint. As usual, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, this assignment, I believe, is due on Friday. And so on Friday, we will have hopefully a very lively discussion about these issues where you should uh, glean more from it. I don't expect for you to become a master or an expert in this area after completing one assignment. So again, you know, my philosophy of education is that 50% of education is exposure. So I'm trying to expose you to a lot of things just so you can see how large these issues are. Uh, but don't get overwhelmed. You should find one specific part of this issue or one niche that fits your background, that fits your educational background and investigate and research and explore it from, from, from that perspective. Uh, you know, don't try to eat the whole steak. You have to chop it up in little pieces first, all right? Okay, so again, as usual, if you have any questions about the assignment, let me know. Um, our, we're about halfway through this. I know it's been intense. And uh, as always, think, work, serve.